Rolling. We're back in the factory. Been so long. This is a random positioning machine. And this episode of the factory is the story of this device. This is easily one of the most complicated things I've ever 3D printed. A random positioning machine will continuously reorient a specimen. In our case, it's intended for plants. It'll continuously reorient that plant specimen so that the plant doesn't know which way up is. This is kind of like being in space. It's kind of like being in microgravity without having to leave the Earth's surface. And so this episode of The Factory is the story of this curious little machine. The Powerhouse Museum were running a program for schools where students would be creating experiments as if they're gonna go into space. And a lot of the experiments that students were pitching were things like plant growth, crystal growth, things, things of that nature, things that these machines are kind of perfect for. And so we were brought into the mix to design and build this device, create kits for students to assemble, and then students can take their experiments and run them in the classroom and simulate being in space. So naturally it had to be pretty affordable and had to use technologies that schools can replicate, things like 3D printing. Now we didn't invent this idea. There's a machine called a Kleinostat, and this looks like the, the patent diagram for it. And this is essentially a pot plant tipped sideways driven by what looks like a motor. So that will just rotate the plant in one direction. And presumably that's good enough for most situations. Random positioning machines exist in one form or another. This is a, looks like a kind of custom built or university lab scale machine. And this is closer to what we're working with. We've got two axes continuously reorienting that sample. And this machine looks very expensive and very specialized. We're gonna have to do something a little bit more accessible. And so this is the design we came up with. This is a two axis random positioning machine. It rotates in this axis this like major outer frame, and then another axis on the inner frame. And this is all made possible by a slip ring right here. So you've got this thing, this frame rotating continuously internally. And so you need to power that inner axis. And for that we use a slip ring, which is a device that allows the wires to continuously rotate without twisting. And so in the major assembly, we have the breadboard with two servo cables and one of the servos is fixed to the outer frame, but the other servo is driven on the inner frame. And so its signal needs to pass through this rotating connection. This is a classic prototyping project. I basically, where's actually, where's my bin of parts? Here we go. This is, this is what it took. I 3D modeled First, like a, a proof of concept single axis, just to kind of dial in something, something that I could like look at and hold and think about a little more tangibly. So this is just the inner rotating experiment platform with a solid drive gear. And I hadn't really thought about the second axis yet. I was really just kind of re-familiarizing myself with CAD. The next iteration is a little more mature. Here we've got what looks like a complete inner frame with experiment platform and the makings of a drive system. These, uh, these Metal Gear servos are just pressed with the small spur gear. And that spur gear is like this beautiful parametric design template. So it was really, really easy. It wasn't an intimidating design at all. But that just presses straight on, Mwah! like no, no real fastening needed. Might add the fastener just to help draw it onto the, to the splined servo shaft. And here we're experimenting with the ideas of now coupling this inner frame to the outer frame. So we just have a, a pivot and a much larger pivot because we need to get the servo wires through this hole in the, in the shaft. So now we have three flavors of gear, the small spur gear, the inner large spur gear, and now the larger outer spur gear to go over that square shaft. And finally, a static outer frame to take the inner frame and accept the slip ring. So in the mature design, the slip ring is actually used as a bearing surface. Probably a bit of a no-no with slip rings, but like we're dealing with very, very low torques here. So the slip ring is actually pinned into the inner frame and it kind of acts like the, the axle for it. Both an electrical slip ring and a mechanical bearing.
The outer frame has these fixed hard points to mount the servers, and we're just using these self-tapping screws that come with the servos to connect them to that frame. The gears are necessary because we want to gear down the angular velocity. If we just had a direct drive from the servo, I think these things would be spinning way too fast. And we also want to magnify the torque. A lot of the work in this project was really in the tuning of fits. Big problems are lots of small problems, right? So the general shape of each platform, it's basically the same problem repeated. You've got something spinning inside of something else and then you step out and you've got something spinning inside of something else. A lot of how this is tuned though comes down to the fit. So we need to have sliding fits for all the shafts, but press fits for all the things that can't move. Things like the gears on the ends of the shaft. So there's a little bit of pro post-processing required for these kinds of prints. You can see the square end for this shaft where a gear gets pressed on is printed in such a way that it has this kind of like elephant footing on the end. So there's a little bit of tuning that we need to do, but it's not so bad. So I assembled the first prototype, had it running on the bench for a few minutes. And then uh, when I looked over to it, only one of the axes was turning, which was very unusual. It, I think it was, it must have been the outer axis was continuing to turn, but the inner axis had frozen. In my initial prototype, I had the slip ring being pinched by the outer frame. So the part that should be spinning was instead seizing in the outer frame and the, ba the slip ring basically failed. The inner frame kept turning and turning and twisting the wires because the slip ring couldn't turn and it just drove itself to destruction. Kind of disheartening, but really not a big deal. We just need to widen that hole to get a good clearance and print another prototype. So I printed another prototype, got it off the bed, snapped it apart, reassembled the second prototype and we did a soak test. We did a life cycle test which was super annoying to have in the office. So it, we eventually wound up putting it in like a closed room, but I let this soak test run for a week. So as we left it running in the corner of the office, I would occasionally just remember that I was meant to check in on it and kind of have a bit of a look and it seemed to be going all right. So life cycle testing is successful, but the window is closing. We've got to get in production mode and produce 12 of these kits. And these are not fast to print. So the new S7 was working overtime. We tiled out the parts and just had the thing running around the clock to produce enough parts in time. And then to guarantee the student's experience, we did all the post-processing in-house. Moving 3D printed parts, designed by someone who doesn't do a lot of 3D printing, are going to need some post-processing so that they run smoothly. So Ahmed and I busted out the file, busted out the hobby knife, and just made sure that all the shafts were smooth, that they had a good sliding fit, that nothing was binding or seizing. It was like a good afternoon of post-processing, but I'm so glad we did it because when Claire showed up from Uncongenieering, we could just give her a package of kits that she could take down to the powerhouse and have the best chances of success. And so we had to get Claire on board with how the thing even comes together. This is a very custom machine. There are no instructions for how to put this together. It's not like an out of the box retail experience or something. We assembled a test unit with Claire to onboard her with the process. And she went home and overnight produced this immaculate documentation that she could hand out to the students on how to assemble the random positioning machine. Look at it, it's gorgeous. And so a testament to how good this documentation is, Claire was able to, by herself, run the workshop and have every group achieve success, get a working machine, unreal. Of course, we're gonna open source it. Come on, we're Core Electronics. So find the link in the description for the repo for this. There is everything you're gonna need. Claire has released the documentation so we can forward that on to you. The whole thing is under a Creative Commons license. Just go ham at it. There are the step files, the STLs that are ready for printing, the code for the Raspberry Pi Pico, Claire's immaculate instructions. Everything's on the repo. Go have fun with it. The experiment platform is designed to have an interference fit with these. Uh, they're not test tubes, they're cultivation tubes, these things, and also to be wide enough to accept a very small Petri dish that you can just like tape on. So also include links of where I source these two. I'm not going to lie, I found this project pretty intimidating at the outset. It's a simple enough idea to describe, to have oh, something that rotates and something else that rotates. 
But as always, the devil's in the details. Uh, we discussed using, instead of gears, we discussed using rubber bands and pulleys. And I thought the, the risk there for slippage might be a little high. And also we, we would then have to curate getting the right size rubber bands. I'm sure it would have worked quite well. It probably would have worked even better, maybe even been a bit quieter. There's no backlash. It's, it would maybe run a bit si more silently, but I found a gear generator. So I used the gear generator to make these. Oh yeah, I guess it's just a, the, the doubt that I felt in creating this is just a testament that like big problems are lots of small problems. Working through my bin of prototyping material, you can see I just kind of worked from the inside out. I started with, I started with the smallest problem and then just built the next layer out of it. And, and it didn't actually take that many tries to get there in the end. It's pretty wild what high school kids get up to these days. I didn't do anything like this when I was in high school, but it's just, it's just a sign of the times, the improving technology, the 3D printing is accessible. So thanks for Powerhouse Museum for like coordinating something cool and thanks to Claire for delivering it. If you make your own random positioning machine, drop us a line. We'd love to see what you get up to with it. And until next time, thanks for watching.